chance to welcome him. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And I just wanted to say that I saw at some point a gaming event about Karmit and Karma to see who has the, the coolest name. I don't know what the results were, but I hope I see something like that coming up again because both acronyms are pretty cool. Um, so I'll share my screen and hopefully you will see some slides. Drag my Zoom this way. Uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Deep Learning for Symbolic Music for Presentations. It's just uh, uh, Iran explained that uh, the, the crowd was kind of like deep learning and MIR 101 uh, kind of uh, background uh, on the audience. So uh, I try to aim for that uh, audience rather than talking about specifically the things that I did uh, recently on my work. So hopefully there's something in there for people who are just uh, getting started with symbolic uh, data. If, if, uh, if you're pursuing different directions, not related to the things that I've been working on. Um, and yeah, so a little bit of me, I, I think Iran already like summarized most of it. So I submitted my dissertation exactly one year ago, uh, August 15, 2022. I graduated from McGill. And I have more focus on computational music theory than uh, deep learning. So I actually started to educate myself about deep learning around 2019. And basically because I saw the potential and all the cool applications that were coming up in conferences like Izmir around that time and all the applications that they have for the kind of uh, problems that I was working on. And currently I'm working in the industry uh, in added technology as one of the developers of the Subedu's, um notation program. So the outline of the talk is essentially an introduction to symbolic music data, uh, representations, how they work, uh, a, bit, uh, a, a bit of a comparison against the uh, audio data and how these two differ and some examples of symbolic music tasks. Then I'll go into a concrete example, which is the thing that I, I've been working on, which is uh, automatic Roman numeral analysis. Um, I'll show an, an end user application of the technology, and then I'll just close with some additional resources that someone might find interesting if they're, um, you know, uh, going into this field. So I'll start with the introduction. Um, a symbolic music file uh, is a file that encodes musical information in a machine readable representation. So you might or may not have heard about some of this. Probably everyone here is familiar with MIDI because it's just ubiquitous in music hardware and, and sort of performance. Um, so it's it's everywhere. But some of the other formats might not be as popular or as common. So I just put here a short list. It's not by all means a comprehensive list of uh, formats, but some of them that you might see in data sets, for example, or related research. So one of them is ABC. And it's a, one of the advantages of ABC is that it's really short. It's a really concise uh, representation. And uh, of course, this comes with the drawback that it only works for single melodies. Then uh, there's uh, Humdrum, which is great for data science. And it, it was kind of developed for that purpose since the 90s. And it's still there. Uh, there's still some uh, large data sets of um, music in, in that format. It's very popular, especially among the people in the classical music analysis world. Then there's Lily Pond, which is, uh, if you ever use LaTeX, then you have seen the markup language. Um, it's very similar to Lily Pond, and uh, it's, it's going to be strikingly similar. There's MEI, which is a, a format that is very popular in web workflows, digital editions. It has lots of things that you can encode about a score. Uh, Music XML, which is another popular one, uh, and it's used as an exchange format for music notation software. So for example, if you're transferring uh, scores from, let's say one application like Civelis to Finale or MuseScore or something else, you will probably use Music XML because it has more information than, um, than a MIDI file, but also uh, it's possible just to like 
uh, to move around between different applications. And of course, there are uh, proprietary formats, uh, which is the last row, and those are specific to an application. So just a couple examples that I wanted to show. Uh, there's a there's a pretty cool app called Folk RNN. This was some research done in Sweden, I believe. And this is just to show you the, um, the ABC format. So if you go to folkrnn.org, and I was able to run some instances here. Yeah, you see it. So it's generating some, this is an RNN that has been trained with folk music and it basically generates sequences of ABC, which are new compositions. So here you see the format, that's, that's, a, that's a full uh, ABC file that uh, represents the score that you see on the screen and basically you can play. I don't know. If... I think you're fine, yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, that's that's uh, that's an example of how the ABC notation looks like, and as you can see, it's really short, really concise, and of course, it's it only works for um, monophonic inputs, so single melodies, but it's still very useful. And there are some data sets that you can um, get for with this representation, and you can process them super quickly using some libraries of Python. So it's a nice way to start if you're interested in running something. Um, the RNN literally outputs the each character of the ABC format. I, I think so, yes. OK. Yep. Thank you. Um, then uh, to show some of the other formats, there is a, a cool application that I like to show. It's a website called Merovio Humdrum Viewer. And this helps us to see some of the other formats in there. So what you're seeing on the screen is a score that has been engraved. Everything that you see in the in the score is uh, SVG, and that SVG comes from an MEI file. So as I mentioned, the MEI is very popular for people who are working on digital editions, and it's because as it's kind of intrinsic in the format that you will have unique identifiers for every element. So if you have a score and then you want to highlight or color or modify the the SVG, then it will be super easy to do in MEI. So that's what you're seeing on the on the right side. And on the left side, what you're seeing is the representation in Humdrum. So for example, if I change something here for, uh, let's say another note, uh, you will see, oh, that's actually dynamics. So probably this one will change the note. So if I just add one more C, you will see that it goes one up the below. And basically, it's a real-time conversion of the of the humdrum into that MEI representation that it's engraved on the right. And also, in this same uh, uh, website, you can save everything as music XML, for example. So then you can see the different uh, flavors of symbolic music data. Um, MEI is it looks like uh, XML, by the way. So this is how the underlying MEI looks like. It's way more verbose than Humdrum. So one cool thing about Hum uh, Humdrum is that it is polyphonic, so you can encode many voices, many uh, parts, and it's uh, also not that actually verbose compared to music XML or it. so. Just uh, if you're curious about like more data or formats or why they so many of them exist, I'm happy to respond questions about that. And the last uh, example, which I'm not going to show, is just a, a, an editor of the Lily font notation, which is, uh, as I mentioned, very similar to LaTeX. So if you have ever used LaTeX, then you will see that Lily font resembles that syntax a lot. And now I'm going to move into comparing uh, symbolic and audio. And here I I kind of feel obliged with doing this because every time there's a, I, I, heard this question so many times. So when you're working with audio, it's uh, actually very difficult to extract musical information from it, right? Because um, audio data is essentially a waveform. So it's a signal of air pressure over time. That's what you're encoding. You're not, you don't know if it's music or if it's um, people talking or it's just like background noise. It's very hard to tell without training a specific machine learning model or uh, digital signal processing techniques to find out whether there's music in that piece of audio or not. 
So it, intrinsically, the anything in audio is complex. In when when it comes to like, for example, retrieving the melodies that are sounding in a piece of audio or separating sources, most of those uh, problems are involved machine learning, and there are people working on them. On the other hand, symbolic data gives us a musical score, performance, and all the information is available. So that we have the notes and we know exactly where they are located in time, what's the pitch content. And we sometimes even have metadata as you know the composer, title, etc. And that's added into the symbolic music representation. So uh, a very uh, common question is like, why do people do research on the symbolic music side um, if it's so easy in terms of like uh, all the information is already there? Like, why would you have to like design machine learning models to analyze that information? It's all encoded and machine readable. And the answer to that is that uh, at least uh, in practice, a lot of the research on the symbolic music research uh, falls into musicology and music theory, for example. So you tend to have more questions that are inclined towards problems uh, in the musicology or music theory area than in engineering, like uh, you know, retrieving the melody of this uh, uh, fragment of audio. And in general, yeah, so we have more granular questions than the audio domain equivalents. I brought some example, uh, examples. So in the audio domain, you would say something like, what is the core that we hear at this time step? And the symbolic equivalent of that could be like, what is the function of the chord in the current musical passage? So it's um, it's kind of the same area, the same problem of chord recognition, but it's a different, it's a more fine, uh, more granular approach when you uh, analyze the problem in, in the symbolic domain. Or here's another example, extract the melody from this flute solo. So assuming that you have an audio recording with the flute uh, in it, and in symbolic, maybe you're looking into motivic patterns. So you want to know out of all of those uh, notes in the in the flute solo, which of them are considered motifs or repetitions of the same pattern, et cetera. So it's a more kind of musicological question of on the same idea. And one of my favorites, so in audio would we'll you you will design an algorithm to find the musical key, and you will want to say, oh, this fragment of music is in C major. And there are lots of applications for that uh, kind of a retrieval task. And in the symbolic domain, you might be interested in changes of musical key within the track. So when the music is changing from one key to another uh, within the same piece of music, then that's a more complicated problem. And that's usually what the people on the symbolic domain care about. Um, just to, I, yep. can I ask you something? Yeah. So I really like how you're breaking this down. And I have to say that I'm definitely more on the audio side of the world. And you are definitely more on the symbolic side of this. So I guess, uh, excuse the pun, but we do a good counterpoint in that sense. However, when it, for us, at least in the audio community, it's very easy to never acknowledge all of these more musical phenomena such as the motifs or the tra the, the the modulations or or the more musical context sometimes we are we very easily just focus on this signal based tasks or problems i wonder if that's your experience because me as an audio researcher it's very easy to never hear the types of things you're describing in the symbolic and I wonder if that also happens in your community. Like, it's very easy to focus on the symbolic problems and just ignore the audio. Like, I get the sense that maybe we don't talk enough as we should. Is, is that also your impression? Can you comment on that? That's absolutely my impression. And honestly, I think it has to do with the background of the people working in the fields. Because um, my experience working on symbolic and McGill was talking to musicologists who maybe don't know how to write code, but they know everything about like, you know, books of music theory or the history of Baroque music or something like that. And it's a very different profile from the person that you will encounter in a 
signal processing conference who is working on a problem of, related to something musical like uh, extracting chords or keys. So I think it also has, it speaks about the, the background of the people working in a particular field. And I think we should definitely uh, talk and have feedback from each other more, but it's, uh, it's challenging. It's challenging. Uh, like, um, I think uh, for me, the first time that I went to Izmir, it was challenging to talk to the audio researchers because generally they didn't uh, understand like why the things that I was working on were difficult, you know? And it, it really was a matter of granularity of the problems. So that's, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> that's why I wanted to bring this up in the, in the talk. And just to finish that thought, your background is, do you have a music degree or do you have more of an engineering uh, background but, uh, before the PhD, I guess? Right. So I did uh, computer science undergrad, but uh, I think most of the time that I spent, I, I also have a music degree, four year uh, music degree, and um, I probably spent more time thinking about musical stuff and like uh, reading music theory. I'm super passionate about that. So uh, I, I always felt inclined towards that audience and that those kinds of questions uh, more than the computer science. Of course, uh, I, it's, I'm happy to code, but uh, I'm also super interested in all the questions that come up with the musicology and music theory communities. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll keep my questions for later, but it's very, it's very fascinating to hear this because, you know, I'll, I'll just, I guess I'll just say this because it's, I find it kind of hilarious. You have a formal CS background in undergrad, right? And you steered towards the symbolic. I have a, my, my undergrad is in music theory and I got sucked into the audio void. <laughs> and I completely ignored the symbolic stuff during my PhD. So we kind of did this crossroads and yeah, it's kind of kind of funny how, you know, background, our backgrounds and where, where we ended up doing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that happens uh, a lot. I, I've seen people with musicology backgrounds who mostly code nowadays. I, they are very good coders. So they, that if that means something, I think is that people can change the direction, right? So nothing is is uh, set on stone or something. You you can change your your path. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's super interesting. I didn't know you had music theory background. Um, okay, so uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt at any point. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions in between. Um, so uh, the last thing that I had before going into my own research was uh, a few symbolic music tasks. So there was a time, and I think you still see papers coming up about Choral generation. And I think it's mostly because of the data set. So people like to use the Bach chorales. There are 370 uh, chorales and they're super well delimited. I think they'll have like between 12 and 20 measures. Uh, they all have four voices. They all have about the same range in each of the voices. So it's a perfect data set for working with uh, models and that's why we have seen things like Bachbot, Coconut, Dibbach coming over the years because people love working with Bach data. So that's one thing that has been popular in symbolic music generation. Um, there's also conditional music generation in the sense that sometimes people want to do melody in painting or continuation given a prompt, and then you want to the model to continue writing music in the, in the style of the prompt that you wrote. And there's research on the on that, on the music transformer, for example, and the more recent anticipatory music transformer that I sent, which came out, uh, it's a preprint from this year. Then there are things that are, uh, I think was, these are kind of specific to the symbolic music domain. So for example, expressive performance, given a MIDI file, which has all the velocities like flat levels. So it's a really uh, robotic performance. You want to 
predict the dynamics. So you want to predict changes of velocity and maybe also change the tempo to make it a bit more humanist, uh, humanistic, human performance, I guess. And um, so that's something that people are working on. Then pattern identification and cluster, which has to do with motifs score following, which is not a trivial problem as it might seem because repetitions, for example. So when you have repetitions in the score, um, in, the, in the audio domain, they will be sort of expanded to, to the audio signal, but in the symbolic domain, you will have to like go back to, the, um, to an earlier section of the score, and then you have to synchronize the audio and the score so that they both uh, coincide. So that's a problem that people have been working on, especially for like orchestras or uh, live performances. It's, it will be an, a nice thing to, to solve and a nice task. And piano finger prediction, because you don't know, uh, if you're learning how to play piano, you don't know exactly which fingers to use. So that might be a, something that you delegate to a machine learning model. And of course, many other problems that uh, have, have, uh, we have seen over the years in, uh, in the symbolic domain. Now I'm moving to the specific uh, example that I brought, which is the thing that I've been working on for the last uh, years, which is automatic Roman numeral analysis. Um, so this, this was the topic of my, of my dissertation. And if, if you don't, uh, so the summary is basically I made improvements to multitask learning methods for automatically annotating a digital score with Roman numeral labels. And if you don't know what Roman numeral analysis is, it's kind of like a form of harmonic analysis of, or chord labeling. So the notation was introduced in the early 19th century and it was slowly adopted throughout the years by music theorists. It looks something like this is actually the first example that introduced the notation uh, in, the, in the sort of form that we see it today still. And I'm highlighting here the keys. So here you will say that the piece starts in C major and then there's a section uh, in A minor. So you indicate that in the score and basically everything after that A column will be relative to that other key. And then after that, you have Roman numerals. And those Roman numerals are actually case sensitive. So when you're, you, you see that the, the kind of like uppercase or bigger case here represents major triads and the uh, uh, small case ones represent minor triads. So this will be like an A minor triad, uh, D minor, etc. So this is the notation that we use. We have some special symbols for, for example, uh, seventh chords and so on. And here you see a combination like we have a, uh, F major, D minor, C major. So that's, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor. Otherwise I've been pointing at stuff and- Yeah, we, we can see it. Okay, cool. So one example that I really like to introduce this, uh, this notation and this problem is this self-contained printer. So this is a piece by Frederick Chopin and all the scores, all the notes that you see, uh, in the, in the screen are basically the full score. That's it, uh, that's the full piece. And in something interesting that happens here is that in measures two and 12, you have the exact same chords arranged in the exact same way. So that those are the same octaves, same pitches. But in the first instance in uh, uh, measure number two, the context is kind of like implying a flat measure. So if you analyze those four chords, that succession of chords, it will take you to a flat major. But in the second instance in measure 12, it's going towards C minor, which is the tonic of the piece. So this piece is in C minor. And where you will write the same A flat and D flat uh, chord labels in the, in the first two uh, chords in this, in both instances, so here I will write A flat and B flat and same here in measure 12, um, I wouldn't write the same Roman numeral because the Roman numeral is uh, dependent on the key. So I will have to analyze the key, know that the first one is actually in the context of A flat major, write the corresponding Roman numerals. And in the second instance, know that that's those chords are working in the context of the C minor key and write those Roman numerals corresponding to the key. And that's what 
uh, is different. Like you could you could actually transfer this to the audio domain, have the same. Um, let's say if this is a, a robotic performance in MIDI, then you will have the same spectrogram, exactly the same spectrogram for this area here for the first two chords, uh, and the first two chords in measure twelve. So basically the same content. Um, either in symbolic or audio domain, but the labels are different. And that has to do with the surrounding music, with the context in which those chords are functioning. So that's that's essentially the problem. Um, computationally, people just reduce it to saying that it's a key finding plus chord labeling problem that you have to do simultaneously. Uh, in practice, you have to do more things. You have to find the inversion of the chord and segment it uh, to to find the boundaries between where chord begins and the next one starts and so on, but generally just like um, those are the big problems that you're trying to solve, like finding the key and the chord simultaneously. And using deep learning, uh, it has been modeled through multitask learning, uh, specifically using CRNNs and transformers. And the other approach has been to use a modular classifier. So, so something that will only predict the chord root, something that only predicts the inversion of the chord, the key, et cetera. So in the first approach, you will have like a musical score in one of the formats that I mentioned, like music XML. Then you have a machine learning model and that machine learning model has two outputs. One that corresponds to the key and one that corresponds to the chord label at a particular time step. And then you use that information to recover the Roman numeral uh, label for that time step. Uh, this was this approach was first introduced in 2018 for this problem uh, by Chen and Su, and there was subsequent research in 2019 and 2021 where the architecture used was a transformer instead of instead of a recurrent neural network. Then in another uh, group of researchers, Miki et al. did something similar in 2020 and 2021. Uh, their approach was exclusively using CRNNs, and that's actually the, the kind of the thread of uh, research that I follow on my own um, contributions. So the other approach, which would be modular, is you have a musical score, and then you have independent classifiers that are specialized on something, like, for example, retrieving the chord label or retrieving the key. There was a very... Um, old, at this point, uh, project uh, that aimed for this kind of analysis called Melisma. And more recently, another paper, McLeod and Vermeer, that did exactly this using deep neural networks. So I'm just going to show you one of the diagrams in the McLeod and Vermeer paper. And here you're seeing the input as the bottom uh, box in here. And every other box on top of that is an independent classifier. So you will have something like a chord transition model, which is modeling the, the segmentation that I mentioned. Then that feeds into the chord classification model and that feeds into the chord sequence model and so on. So it's kind of like a complicated uh, multi-stage kind of uh, approach to, to retrieve the final um, Roman numeral label. And the input, I, I have a question. This is pretty fascinating because I have never done this kind of stuff. Um, so the input is what, like tokenized things embedded or is it one hot type of representations? What is it? Uh, in in this particular model, I think it is a one hot encoding. And I think most of them are actually one hot encodings. But I, I'm not... 100% sure that this will be the same for all the all the modules in here. So it um, you can see, for example, that the input goes into the core classification, and some of these feed into each other. So I'm not sure what's the what's the strategy there, but I think it's one code encoding mostly. Okay, that's pretty cool. Uh, I was just curious about that. But I, I, basically, my question was like, it's not audio, right? <laughs> I, I was just like trying to ask like a very obvious question, like. There's no audio here. It's like some sort of very symbolic type of processing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but it's funny because we we sort of sample the symbolic data. I, I'm going to get into that when I talk about the, the my architecture. And it's funny because we are kind of like imitating <laughs> what audio researchers would do. Um, so I I I 
sort of uh, went this route with the multitask learning classification. And I basically the, the purpose of the research that I was doing was to extend the methods that we see in multitask learning classification. So one of the contributions was a new neural network architecture, which I named augmented net, and it mostly came because uh, part of the architecture is to increase the number of classification outputs. So that's cool. Uh, and, and there was a new um, data augmentation technique. So that that just uh, justified the name. So this is what the uh, augmented neural network architecture looks like. So it's also a CRNN as the Mickey et al. models from 2020 and 2021. Uh, it's multi-input and multi-output. So we have three inputs that represent different aspects of the of the pitch content and the, the essentially the notes. And each of them is processed by a convolution block. Then these are concatenated. And at this point, we're at the multitask learning where all of these weights are uh, shared between all the different classifiers. So we have dense layers and we have uh, bidirectional GRUs. In my experiments, uh, that was the flavor of uh, recurrent neural networks that work the best. So people use LSTMs here, um, but I found better results with GRUs. So that's the kind of unit that I use. And at the end, at the other side of the network, we have multiple classification problems. But these all, all of these problems are sharing the same parameters from the internal uh, hidden layers. So we have nine classification problems. The first one that I'm highlighting here has to do with the segmentation, which I call harmonic rhythm. And it's essentially trying to uh, establish where chords start and where chords end. So just segment the score so that you know when to when to label it, basically, when in which time steps you want to put a label. Um, then we have two classifiers that have to do with key analysis. And here I went to, for two analysis of key because we have long-term sort of uh, analysis of key, and then this very short-term um, changes of key. And this might be too technical for people who are not uh, familiar with music theory, but there's this, uh, if you have ever heard about secondary dominance, that's kind of the, the thing that we want to model with this, uh, two, um, two, these two classification problems. So we want to model changes of key, but we also want to model fluctuations that are almost instantaneous. So when you're applying one chord in a different key, uh, but it almost immediately fades away uh, because you resolve it or something, then you will want to change that key just almost in an instantaneous manner. So that's that's what the tonicization uh, classifier is doing, and the other one's trying to look at more like long term changes of key. So the, and, um, so the thirty eight is the shape of the output, right? Or yes, what yeah, so it's the a, number of uh, classes. So you have twelve minor, twelve major, twelve like uh, I uh, my math is not adding up there. What is it? Yeah. So one of the important aspects of the um, of the problem itself is that we use pitch spelling. So that, that goes all the way to the input. So we will dis distinguish between F sharp and G flat. So those two will, will be different uh, output classes. So in the case of keys, we do consider um, 38 and it's easier instead of thinking about 12 major and 12 minor, it's easier to think in terms of the circle of fifths or the line of fifths. So if you'd never, you know, uh, go the route of calling two in harmonics uh, the same class, then you will have a line that goes for, for example, uh, you know, uh, C flat and then G flat and then D flat, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the sharp section of the line and we are covering 38 keys in that line does that make sense yeah so then uh yeah that makes perfect sense at least to me that i have a full uh, music theory degree <laughs> but <laughs> my question is is the tone sensation basically like a dominant detector is that basically what it is yes that that's kind of it 
Um, it's not necessarily a dominant. So sometimes you will have a model mixture, which will be like changing from C major to C minor and back and forth. And that's those are the kind of instances that you will want to detect with the tonization classifier. Uh, secondary dominance are, of course, the most um, probably the, 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 the things that happen the most, but not the only fluctuations that are, have to do with tonization. Thank you. Um, and everything else is related to chords. So there, these are tasks that have to do with finding the, the chord root, uh, the chord inversion, and so on. Um, yeah, so that th those are the outputs. Now I'm, now I'm going to talk a bit about the inputs. Uh, the inputs are, are 600. It's a fixed size input. So we process 640 time steps. And, and that's a fixed size. So meaning that if we have a, uh, an input that is less than 640 time steps, then we will pad it. Uh, we will pad everything to fit exact uh, size that we're looking for. And six, each of those time steps corresponds to a 30 second note. And that's where I was talking about like how we sort of mimic the audio domain. So I'll, I'll, I think I'll explain it better when I put this graph. So the first input that we receive is the notes that are sounding at the current time step. And we don't have, we don't encode the octave information. So it's similar to how a chromogram will look like, except that we have uh, pitch spelling. So this is the representation that on the on the top you see the score, and on the bottom you see the encoding for that score in that particular input. There are three inputs, so this is the first one. And what you see in the grid is essentially each of the time steps and the and the values that we're encoding for that time step. Um, we encode the the name of the note. And that's how we encode the spelling. So we will say that the first note, it's called G, and it's a pitch class seven. So if you don't know what the pitch class is, imagine that you're seeing a keyboard, uh, one octave of a, of a piano keyboard, and then you're labeling the notes from zero to 11 before you reach the next octave. So number seven, starting from C, will coincide with the G natural. And that's the note that you're seeing in the score. And each of these uh, time steps is a 30 second note. So for the first um, note that we're seeing in this voice, it's an eight note uh, that will last for four time steps. And then this D natural and B flat will kick in. So those are encoded as part of the representation. So you will see D and B as the note letters that are also adding to this representation and the corresponding pitch classes. So the pitch class of a D natural will be a pitch class two and 10 will be the pitch class of the B flat. And we basically sample all the score using this approach. And that's what you're seeing in the, in the bottom part of the picture. Then the second type of input uh, it's called the lowest note 19. It's a very similar uh, representation. We also have 19. Um, it's a vector of 19 values per time step. And um, it's uh, essentially the same, except that we only encode the lowest sounding note at each time step. So for example, here we have G and because there are two voices and one of them has like a dotted um, half, then it will just go on. And that's that's at, at any given point of this uh, first measure, everything we're hearing is just G um, natural as the base. And it continues all the way here. And then things start to change because we don't have this like uh, dotted uh, half anymore. So then the, the lowest sounding note is changing starting from the third measure and so on. And this is uh, this representation is super important to basically predict the base and the inversion of the chord. Without this, it will be super hard to know what's the inversion of the chord. So that's why we need the separate input that just uh, encodes that information. And 
the last part is just making um, it's just bringing back the information about the onsets of the nodes because in the process of sampling in 30 second nodes we don't know anymore where the nodes begin or where the nodes end and same for the measures so there's another representation that is encoding changes of measure which are on the bottom so you will see that onset is encoded in this uh, um, in this uh, value of the vector and you will see that it happens every 24 time steps which will be each of those uh, so each of those measures in a 6-8 time signature will last for 24 time steps and that's where we are encoding changes of measure um, this is important because time signatures can change in the score. So you could have, you could move from 6A to like 2, 4 or something in the middle of the score. And that will effectively change the representation of your encoding and also the harmonic rhythm of the score. So that's, that's what's being encoded in the bottom part. And the upper part is encoding each note onset. So every time that there's a, a new uh, slice of notes that is sounding, you will then code that as an onset, onset. So for example, here you see eight notes, eight notes, eight notes, and here there's a little gap where there's there are no additional attacks until you get to this A. So that's that will be this one that is a bit longer, and then you go back to this onset right here, coinciding with the A natural, and so on. So Basically, that's that's what you will encode, and it might seem completely arbitrary to do this encoding. So we ran some ablation studies for people who are not familiar with ablation studies. These are um, we we'll talked about ablation studies today, so, but go ahead. Yeah, Thank perfect. You. So we had some ablation studies where we experiment with removing parts of those uh, uh, sections of the near network. Um, I'm not going to get too much into it. So each of these uh, columns in here represents each of the classifiers in the multi-test learning uh, classification problem. This is accuracy, average, and the standard deviation on uh, the sub-index there. And then each of those rows is an ablation study. So for example, when we remove the onsets and the measures and uh, note onsets, then we will see a drop in of 21.2% in the accuracy of the harmonic rhythm classifier, which means that if we remove this input, then it hurts the harmonic rhythm or the segmentation of the chords. So that's how we know that having that information contributes to the um, accuracy of the harmonic rhythm. If we remove it, then it, it goes down. And the same thing for removing the recurrent uh, layers, the GRUs. So if we remove them, and this is interesting, I personally find it interesting because the, the, the two classification tasks that are heard the most when you remove the RNNs are the ones that have to do with key. And generally, keys span a uh, longer term uh, time series than chords. So a chord might be like maybe eight or 16 time steps in the, in the input. But the uh, key could be something like, you know, 300 uh, time steps. So this sort of coincides with what would you expect by removing the RNN part, the things that is modeling sort of long-term dependencies, then you're um, being, you're getting this uh, drop in performance in key estimation. So that was uh, the ablation studies for justifying the architecture. Then we basically chunk together all the data that we can find on Roman numerals, which is distributed across different data sets, different formats, just basically try to like aggregate it, turn it into a unified data set. It adds to about 100,000 annotations. Those are chord labels, so 100,000 chord label annotations, uh, divided in training validation and test, and then uh, doing data augmentation. So the most research on the symbolic side, especially in tonal music analysis, will do transposition, which is you basically take the same score and transpose it to different keys. And that's how you increase the number of training examples. 
So we added one additional data augmentation technique, which consisted of generating um, artificial scores. And these scores were generated basically by just having the raw labels from the, from the training set and rendering the ports that you will have from those annotations and then basically adding texturization patterns like syncopation, Alberti-based figures and stuff like that. And that becomes a training example for those uh, labels. So basically you generate a bunch of scores that are just artificial data texturized in this way. And these are the results obtained from that process. So in blue, you have the original data set without any modifications. Then the orange line is what happens when you do this artificial uh, scores generated and texturized. And then transposition, which is the technique that everyone uses for, um, for extending or augmenting the, the number of training examples and the combination of both in red, which is the topmost uh, line. And here, maybe it looks like it's not improving that much. When you do like a data set by data set, it's a bit clearer than combining synthesis and transposition gives you better results. So that's, uh, that's a contribution for trying to squeeze as much as possible from the data that we have on Roman numerals by adding more data augmentation. And then we evaluated this, uh, this workflow and uh, compared to uh, other methods. So we're interested in the time performance specifically because the MacLeod and Wormeyer was a modular approach. So this was independent neural networks for each of the each of the classification problems. It was not an end-to-end -end approach and it, it shows. So when you're trying to predict in 94 files, which are the best set, then it's much, uh, it takes a long time in comparison to the uh, multitask classification problems, uh, multitask um, architectures. Then when you look at accuracy on individual tasks, uh, these are the results. And here, what I, what I mean by PC set is just essentially chord labels. This was the way that I expressed uh, what a chord label is, which is just a, a set of each classes. Um, but it, that's essentially what it means. And then you have the key of the, of the time steps and the inversion. And maybe the most uh, interesting of the evaluations was a kind of a core by core comparison. And you see in this uh, column, uh, the occurrence, which is how the occurrence in the, day, in the test set essentially. So basically, you will see that 73% of the Roman numeral labels are just like tonic and dominant chords. And that speaks about how heavily skewed the data is. So you will see here a lot of tonic triads and a lot of dominant triads and everything else is much scarce in the, in the data set. So once you look at that picture, then it's very um, obvious that even though the, the proposed network, the augmented net is doing well, you still have like three classes of course that go completely unrecognized. So none of the models are able to identify uh, either of the, of the examples of these uh, court, uh, classes in the, in the test. So, um, then this is a, a plot of the distribution. So you will see like uh, what I shared before. So the first four classes, tonic in major mode and tonic in minor mode plus dominant seven and dominant just make up for most of the data. And then everything else is much more, um, uh, it occurs less often. Uh, here are the references in case you wanna look at the, everything that I have described. It's uh, basically distributed across the PhD thesis and one paper that we presented in 2021. And um, just to mention that uh, this technology, we recently used it in, uh, in Sibelius. So in June, we released a, um, a build that has a core auto completion. And that core auto completion feature is basically 
um, implemented with this neural network behind the scenes. So you will start um, doing chord annotations and it's running uh, a flavor of this neural network behind the scenes and it will put the labels for you. Then you have multiple suggestions. All of these are coming from sampling the outputs of the classifier. So this is just an example of the things that you could do with this kind of technology. And I think I'm getting close to finishing, so I'll just run through this. There are some resources that I thought could share with people who are interested in doing more uh, deep learning for music, uh, symbolic music. And there's this, in particular, this book called Deep Learning Techniques for Music Generation. If you are familiar with transformers and modern deep learning, probably this book is completely irrelevant and you can safely ignore it, except for chapter four, because there's a good discussion of representation. Yeah, the, the, the things that we were talking about, like whether you want hard in code, benefits of that, cons, and so on. So this might be interesting for anyone who's uh, planning to work on some uh, music stuff. And some examples of uh, projects that you can um, work on and, and, and basically projects that have code available and you can look at the code, run it, test the models, and so on. Uh, there are some data sets too. I mentioned the back corrals. There's a, there's a uh, version of the backgrounds uh, uploaded by Craig Sapp, which is uh, who is actually a professor at Stanford in the CCRH uh, uh, lab. I don't know if you know about them. They are kind of your neighbors and Karma. And a few other places. Oh? I was just saying that they are down the hill. They are, um, so there's Karma and there's okay. a car. And Kakar is the humanities, the more general humanities counterpart to karma. Uh, yeah, I'll, I was going to say that. So they have some good uh, libraries of like symbolic music data in one side called Caring Scores. So if you're interested, you can talk to them. And there's some libraries and like uh, particularly, I use Music 21 a lot. I know that a lot of people are using uh, deep learning for small music research, like rely on this library a lot. So it's a nice library to process music XML, MIDI, hum germ data, and so on. And that's it. I think I took more time, but I. Woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> wow, you, you did so much. Uh, great work. Let's see, we have some time for questions. I hope it's not just me who asks questions, right? So let's see, who's gonna ask a question? Uh, I have a question on that one epochs graph um, from the data augmentation. Yes. Like, yeah, I noticed that there was these like upside down peaks. Um, uh, sure. Yes. Peaks. Yeah. So, like, uh, like the red line, for example, or like the green line. I noticed that, like, even as the epochs continued, like those upside down peaks kind of like dropped down pretty low. I was wondering, like, if you had any thoughts on, like, maybe why um, those kind of the performance kind of changed at those kind of uh, points in time, um, or it might be just. The, the way that the model training, I guess, works. Yeah, so I think this, um, so first of all, all of these plots are coming from test set. So this is test, uh, uh, in this case, accuracy. And I think those bumps are probably representations where, where the training loss is going down. So, if the, the network is technically coming with a better representation that minimizes the loss. But when you run that on the test set, which is not being used or not being fed to the, to the training uh, part of the workflow, then it does worse than the previous representation. So it will be like sort of overfitting at that particular point. 
I don't know why they are so short though. Usually what will happen is that um, you will, uh, at, at one point you start to overfit and your training loss and your accuracy are improving on the training set, but getting worse and worse on the test data. And in this case, and that's a particular thing that happens. I don't know why I don't really have an explanation for it, but it happens a lot when you use multiple classification problems simultaneously. So in this multitask learning paradigm, you will have these kind of bumps and uh, it looks like the network is getting worse at times, but then it just comes back. And if you look at the accuracy, it does seem like it's going up in the later epochs compared to the beginning. So there's a difference in, in these peaks in comparison to, for example, this peak. So I, I, and I think it does get better, but you have this bumpy behavior and I, I would, the only explanation that I have for it is that those are representations of your learning, which improve on the training set, but get worse momentarily on the validation set. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, good question. All right, maybe we have time for another question. Let's see. Someone has a question? Leo, Leo has a question. Hi, yeah, I was uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the choice to make this, you know, multitask and uh, rather than having the individual networks to, to handle different classification tasks and sort of, I don't know, I, I guess pros and cons of, of, of each approach. Um, I, cl clearly it's faster, but do you think that, that you could have achieved better performance if you had done uh, individual networks? Uh, yeah, I'll let you go from there. Yeah. Uh, so I can tell you my motivation, beside the, the, let's say the technical aspect, uh, of implementing as a multitask uh, workflow and maybe being some of the papers that I saw that had like good results were multitask. So that definitely played a, a role in deciding to go this, uh, this path. It's also much easier to implement. So one thing that you probably want to do when you're running experiments, deep learning is run as many experiments as you possibly can. So if you have an idea, you want to iterate over that idea, find out if it works or not, and then just uh, change directions as, as, as you find you know, the results of your experiments and then just basically keep running as many experiments as you can. And one thing that I can say about task learning is that once you implement it the first time, let's say you have the, the, the backbone of the code that will add all of these classification layers to your model, to your architecture, then it's super easy to replace them, to remove some of them, just essentially like in the order of commenting one line of code. And then one of those classification layers disappears, you retrain the network, and then you're running another experiment. So it's super fast to iterate over the signs and different ideas. Whereas if you design a specific model for each of those classification uh, tasks, then you probably have to modify the entire thing. Uh, if you change your mind or you, you find a better approach or want to try a new idea, then you probably have to write a lot more code for that. So in terms of just practicality of implementation, it's uh, I found it much easier to do multitask. But Nestor, is there evidence to showing that having individual models could lead to better performance? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you can find a combination of individual models that, you know, uh, outperforms a multitask network. It's just how much effort and time it will take you to find that combination. Um, because for example, in the MacLeod and Wormeyer, I would assume that they spent some time just looking at how to define the core segmentation write the model for that, 
and you know they have to repeat that process for all of the other problems. Whereas here is just one architecture, and it, you don't have to change anything essentially. So I, I I think it's possible. I just don't think it's feasible to do as many experiments that way. Okay. Were your inputs yeah. all MIDI files? So the inputs are typically music XML. Um, one of the important things that we need is the spelling. So we will have to know if it's a G sharp or an A flat at uh, a particular time step. And MIDI doesn't really allow you to encode that. You can encode it with tricks, but the representation itself is just octave and pitch class. So you wouldn't know if it's like a G sharp or A flat. Um, so that's one drawback of MIDI, and we prefer the formats that do provide that information explicitly. It's easier to work that way. In in this case, it was music XML. Would there, um, in that case, would there be any way to um, put raw audio into this network, or would it have to be encoded in music XML first? Right, uh, so you could repeat basically the same approach that, or the same input representation in audio, except for the spelling. Because um, in audio, you will probably run a chromogram analyzer, and there are many algorithms to compute chromograms. And that will substitute um, two of the, of the input um, uh, vectors that we're sending or input tensors that we're sending to the network. You could, they could come from the audio domain, but the spelling probably not. So I would, I would expect the results to just to go down just because of that. Um, so yeah, you will not get the same performance as in the symbolic domain, but it's possible. Cool. Uh, well, I, I want to acknowledge that we are over time, but I don't want to stop the discussion if there's more questions.